Author's Note and Section 1 of Yet Again by Max Beerbohm. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirsten Weber. Yet Again by Max Beerbohm. Author's Note till i gave myself the task of making a little selection from what i had written since last i formed a book of essays i had no notion that i had put as it were my eggs into so many baskets the saturday review the new quarterly the new liberal review vanity fair the daily mail literature the traveller the pall mall magazine the may book the souvenir book of charing cross hospital bazaar the cornhill magazine harper's magazine the anglo-saxon review oof but the sigh of relief that i heave at the end of this list is accompanied by a smile of thanks to the various authorities for letting me use here what they were so good as to require m b Section 1. The Fire If I were seeing over a house, and found in every room an iron cage let into the wall, and were told by the caretaker that these cages were for me to keep lions in, I think I should open my eyes rather wide. Yet nothing seems to me more natural than a fire in the grate— doubtless when i began to walk one of my first excursions was to the fender that i might gaze more nearly at the live thing roaring and raging behind it and i dare say i dimly wondered by what blessed dispensation this creature was allowed in a domain so peaceful as my nursery i do not think i ever needed to be warned against scaling the fender i knew by instinct that the creature within it was dangerous fiercer still than the cat which had once strayed into the room and scratched me for my advances as i grew older i ceased to wonder at the creature's presence and learned to call it the fire quite lightly there are so many queer things in the world that we have no time to go on wondering at the queerness of the thing we see habitually it is not that these things are in themselves less queer than they at first seemed to us. It is that our vision of them has been dimmed. We are lucky when, by some chance, we see again, for a fleeting moment, this thing or that, as we saw it when it first came within our ken. We are in the habit of saying that first impressions are best— and that we must approach every question with an open mind but we shirk the logical conclusion that we were wiser in our infancy than we are now make yourself even as a little child we often say but recommending the process on moral rather than on intellectual grounds and inwardly preening ourselves all the while on having put away childish things as though clarity of vision were not one of them i look around the room i am writing in a pleasant room and my own yet how irresponsive how smug and lifeless the pattern of the wallpaper blamelessly repeats itself from wainscot to cornice and the pictures are immobile and changeless within their glazed frames faint flat mimicries of life the chairs and tables are just as their carpenter fashioned them, and stand with stiff obedience just where they have been posted. On one side of the room, encased in coverings of cloth and leather, are myriads of words, which to some people, but not to me, are a fair substitute for human company. All around me, in fact, are the products of modern civilization but in the whole room there are but three things living myself my dog and the fire in my grate and of these lives the third is very much the most intensely vivid my dog is descended doubtless from prehistoric wolves but you could hardly decipher his pedigree on his mild domesticated face 
my dog is as tame as his master in whose veins flows the blood of the old cavemen but time has not tamed fire fire is as wild a thing as when prometheus snatched it from the empyrean fire in my grate is as fierce and terrible a thing as when it was lit by my ancestors night after night at the mouths of their caves to scare away the ancestors of my dog and my dog regards it with the old wonder and misgiving even in his sleep he opens ever again one eye to see that we are in no danger and the fire glowers and roars through its bars at him with the scorn that a wild beast must needs have for a tame one you are free it rages and yet you do not spring at that man's throat and tear him limb from limb and make a meal of him and gazing at me it licks its red lips and i laughing good-humouredly rise and give the monster a shovelful of its proper food which it leaps at and noisily devours fire is the only one of the elements that inspires awe we breathe air tread earth bathe in water fire alone we approach with deference and it is the only one of the elements that is always alert always good to watch we do not see the air we breathe except sometimes in london and who shall say that the sight is pleasant we do not see the earth revolving and the trees and other vegetables that are put forth by it come up so slowly that there is no fun in watching them one is apt to lose patience with the good earth and to hanker after a sight of those multitudinous fires whereover it is after all but a thin and comparatively recent crust water when we get it in the form of a river is pleasant to watch for a minute or so after which period the regularity of its movement becomes as tedious as stagnation it is only a whole seaful of water that can rival fire in variety and in loveliness but even the spectacle of sea at its very best say in an atlantic storm is less thrilling than the spectacle of one building ablaze and for the rest the sea has its hours of dullness and monotony even when it is not wholly calm whereas in the grate even a quite little fire never ceases to be amusing and inspiring until you let it out as much fire as would correspond with a handful of earth or a tumbler full of water is yet a joy to the eyes and a lively suggestion of grandeur the other elements even as presented in huge samples impress us as less august than fire fire alone according to the legend was brought down from heaven the rest were here from the dim outset when we call a thing earthy we impute cloddishness by watery we imply insipidness airy is for something trivial fiery has always a noble significance it denotes such things as faith courage genius earth lies heavy and air is void and water flows down but flames aspire flying back towards the heaven they came from they typify for us the spirit of man as apart from aught that is gross in him they are the symbol of purity of triumph over corruption water air earth can all harbour corruption but where flames are or have been there is innocence our love of fire comes partly doubtless from our natural love of destruction for destruction's sake fire is savage and so even after all these centuries are we at heart our civilization is but as the aforesaid crust that encloses the old planetary flames to destroy is still the strongest instinct of our nature nature is still red in tooth and claw though she has begun to make fine flourishes with toothbrush and nail scissors 
even the mild dog on my hearth-rug has been known to behave like a wolf to his own species scratch his master and you will find the caveman but the scratch must be a sharp one i am thickly veneered outwardly i am as gentle as you gentle reader and one reason for our delight in fire is that there is no humbug about flames they are frankly primevally savage but this is not i am glad to say the sole reason we have a sense of good and evil i do not pretend that it carries us very far it is but the toothbrush and nail scissors that we flourish our innate instincts not this acquired sense are what the world really hinges on but this acquired sense is an integral part of our minds and we revere fire because we have come to regard it as especially the foe of evil as a means for destroying weeds not flowers a destroyer of wicked cities not of good ones the idea of hell as inculcated in the books given to me when i was a child never really frightened me at all i conceived the possibility of a hell in which were eternal flames to destroy every one who had not been good but a hell whose flames were eternally impotent to destroy these people a hell where evil was to go on writhing yet thriving for ever and ever seemed to me even at that age too patently absurd to be appalling nor indeed do i think that to the more credulous children in england can the idea of eternal burning have ever been quite so forbidding as their nurses meant it to be credulity is but a form of incaution i as i have said never had any wish to play with fire but most english children are strongly attracted and are much less afraid of fire than of dark eternal darkness with a biting east wind were to the english fancy a far more fearful prospect than eternal flames the notion of these flames arose in italy where heat is no luxury and shadows are lurked in and breezes prayed for in england the sun even at its strongest is a weak vessel true we grumble whenever its radiance is a trifle less watery than usual but that is precisely because we are a people whose nature the sun has not mellowed a dour people like all northerners ever ready to make the worst of things inwardly we love the sun and long for it to come nearer to us and to come more often and it is partly because this craving is unsatisfied that we cower so fondly over our open hearths our fires are makeshifts for sunshine autumn after autumn we see the swallows gathering in the sky and in the osier isle we hear their noise and our hearts sink happy selfish little birds gathering so lightly to fly whither we cannot follow you will you not this once forego the lands of your desire shall not the grief of the old time follow do winter with us this once we will strew all england every morning with bread-crumbs for you will you but stay and help us to play at summer but the delicate cruel rogues pay no heed to us skimming sharplier than ever in pursuit of gnats as the hour draws near for their long flight over gnatless seas only one swallow have i ever known to relent it had built its nest under the eaves of a cottage that belonged to a friend of mine a man who loved birds he had a power of making birds trust him they would come at his call circling round him perching on his shoulder eating from his hand one of the swallows would come too from his nest under the eaves as the summer wore on he grew quite tame and when summer waned and the other swallows flew away this one lingered day after day fluttering dubiously over the threshold of the cottage 
Presently, as the air grew chilly, he built a new nest for himself, under the mantelpiece, in my friend's study, and every morning, so soon as the fire burned brightly, he would flutter down to perch on the fender and bask in the light and warmth of the coals. But after a few weeks he began to ail, possibly because the study was a small one, and he could not get in it the exercise that he needed more probably because of the draughts. My friend's wife, who was very clever with her needle, made for the swallow a little jacket of red flannel, and sought to divert his mind by teaching him to perform a few simple tricks. For a while he seemed to regain his spirits, but presently he moped more than ever, crouching nearer than ever to the fire, and sidelong, blinking dim, weak reproaches at his disappointed master and mistress. One swallow, as the adage truly says, does not make a summer. So this one's mistress hurriedly made for him a little overcoat of seal-skin, wearing which, in a muffled cage, he was personally conducted by his master straight through to Sicily. There he was nursed back to health, and liberated on a sunny plain he never returned to his english home but the nest he built under the mantelpiece is still preserved in case he should come at last when the sun's rays slant down upon your grate then the fire blanches and blenches cowers crumbles and collapses it cannot compete with its archetype it cannot suffice a sun-steeped swallow, or ripen a plum, or parch the carpet. Yet, in its modest way, it is to your room what the sun is to the world, and where, during the greater part of the year, would you be without it? I do not wonder that the poor, when they have to choose between fuel and food, choose fuel. Food nourishes the body, but fuel, warming the body, warms the soul, too. I do not wonder that the hearth has been regarded from time immemorial as the centre and used as the symbol of the home. I like the social tradition that we must not poke a fire in a friend's drawing-room unless our friendship dates back full seven years. It rests, evidently, this tradition, on the sentiment that a fire is a thing sacred to the members of the household in which it burns. I dare say the fender has a meaning as well as a use, and is as the rail round the altar. In the new utopia these hearths will all have been raised, of course, as demoralizing relics of an age when people went in for privacy, and were not always thinking exclusively about the state. Such heat as may be needed to prevent us from catching colds, whereby our vitality would be lowered and our usefulness to the state impaired, will be supplied through hot water pipes, white enameled, the supply being strictly regulated from the municipal waterworks. Or has Mr. Wells arranged that the sun shall always be shining on us? I have mislaid my copy of the book. Anyhow, fires and hearths will have to go. Let us make the most of them while we may. Personally, though I appreciate the radiance of a family fire, I give preference to a fire that burns for myself alone. And dearest of all to me is a fire that burns thus in the house of another. I find an inalienable magic in my bedroom fire when I am staying with friends, and it is at bedtime that the spell is strongest. Good night says my host, shaking my hand warmly on the threshold. You've everything you want? Everything, I assure him. Good night. Good night. Good night. And I close my door, close my eyes, heave a long sigh, open my eyes, set down the candle, draw the armchair close to the fire, my fire, sink down, and am at peace, with nothing to mar my happiness except the feeling that it is too good to be true. 
At such moments I never see in my fire any likeness to a wild beast. It roars me as gently as a sucking dove, and is as kind and cordial as my host and hostess and the other people in the house. And yet I do not have to say anything to it. I do not have to make myself agreeable to it. It lavishes its warmth on me, asking nothing in return. For fifteen mortal hours or so, with few and brief intervals, I have been making myself agreeable, saying the right thing, asking the apt question, exhibiting the proper shade of mild or acute surprise, smiling the appropriate smile or laughing just so long and just so loud as the occasion seemed to demand. If I were naturally a brilliant and copious talker, I suppose that to stay in another's house would be no strain on me. I should be able to impose myself on my host and hostess and their guests without any effort, and at the end of the day retire quite unfatigued, pleasantly flushed with the effect of my own magnetism. Alas, there is no question of my imposing myself. I can repay hospitality only by strict attention to the humble, arduous process of making myself agreeable. When I go up to dress for dinner, I have always a strong impulse to go to bed and sleep off my fatigue, and it is only by exerting all my willpower that I can array myself for the final labors. To wit, making myself agreeable to some man or woman for a minute or two before dinner, to two women during dinner, to men after dinner, then again to women in the drawing-room, and then once more to men in the smoking-room. It is a dog's life, but one has to have suffered before one gets the full savour out of joy, and I do not grumble at the price I have to pay for the sensation of basking, at length, in solitude, and the glow of my own fireside. Too tired to undress, too tired to think, I am more content to watch the noble and ever-changing pageant of the fire. The finest part of this spectacle is surely when the flames sink, and gradually the red-gold caverns are revealed, gorgeous, mysterious, with inmost recesses of white heat. It is often thus that my fire welcomes me when the long day's task is done, after I have gazed long into its depths, I close my eyes to rest them, opening them again with a start whenever a coal shifts its place, or some belated little tongue of flame spurts forth with a hiss. Vaguely I liken myself to the watchman one sees by night in London, wherever a road is up, huddled half awake in his tiny cabin of wood, with a cresset of live coal before him. I have come down in the world, and am a night watchman, and I find the life as pleasant as I had always thought it must be, except when I let the fire out and awake shivering. Shivering, I awake in the twilight of dawn, ashes white and grey, some rusty cinders, a crag or so of coal, are all that is left over from last night's splendor. Gray is the lawn beneath my window, and little ghosts of rabbits are nibbling and hobbling there. But anon the east will be red, and ere I wake the sky will be blue and the grass quite green again, and my fire will have arisen from its ashes, a crackling and comfortable phoenix. End of section one. Section two of Yet Again by Max Beerbohm. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Seeing people off. I am not good at it. To do it well seems to me one of the most difficult things in the world, and probably seems so to you, too. To see a friend off from Waterloo to Vauxhall were easy enough. 
but we are never called on to perform that small feat it is only when a friend is going on a longish journey and will be absent for a longish time that we turn up at the railway station the dearer the friend and the longer the journey and the longer the likely absence the earlier do we turn up and the more lamentably do we fail our failure is an exact ratio to the seriousness of the occasion and to the depth of our feeling in a room or even on a doorstep we can make the farewell quite worthily we can express in our faces the genuine sorrow we feel nor do words fail us there is no awkwardness no restraint on either side the thread of our intimacy has not been snapped the leave-taking is an ideal one why not then leave the leave-taking at that always departing friends implore us not to bother to come to the railway station next morning always we are deaf to these entreaties knowing them to be not quite sincere the departing friends would think it very odd of us if we took them at their word besides they really do want to see us again and that wish is heartily reciprocated we duly turn up and then oh then what a gulf yawns we stretch our arms vainly across it we have utterly lost touch we have nothing at all to say we gaze at each other as dumb animals gaze at human beings we make conversation and such conversation we know that these are the friends from whom we parted overnight they know that we have not altered yet on the surface everything is different and the tension is such that we only long for the guard to blow his whistle and put an end to the farce on a cold grey morning of last week i duly turned up at euston to see off an old friend who was starting for america overnight we had given him a farewell dinner in which sadness was well mingled with festivity years probably would elapse before his return some of us might never see him again not ignoring the shadow of the future we gaily celebrated the past we were as thankful to have known our guest as we were grieved to lose him and both these emotions were made evident it was a perfect farewell and now here we were stiff and self-conscious on the platform and framed in the window of the railway carriage was the face of our friend but it was as the face of a stranger a stranger anxious to please an appealing stranger an awkward stranger have you got everything asked one of us breaking a silence yes everything said our friend with a pleasant nod everything he repeated with the emphasis of an empty brain you will be able to lunch on the train said i though this prophecy had already been made more than once oh yes he said with conviction he added that the train went straight through to liverpool this fact seemed to strike us as rather odd we exchanged glances doesn't it stop at crew asked one of us no said our friend briefly he seemed almost disagreeable there was a long pause one of us with a nod and a forced smile at the traveller said well the nod the smile and the unmeaning monosyllable were returned conscientiously another pause was broken by one of us with a fit of coughing it was an obviously assumed fit but it served to pass the time the bustle of the platform was unabated there was no sign of the train's departure release ours and our friends was not yet my wandering eye alighted on a rather portly middle-aged man who was talking earnestly from the platform to a young lady at the next window but one to ours his fine profile was vaguely familiar to me the young lady was evidently american and he was evidently english otherwise i should have guessed from his impressive air that he was her father i wished i could hear what he was saying i was sure he was giving the very best advice and the strong tenderness of his gaze was really beautiful he seemed magnetic as he poured out his final injunctions 
i could feel something of his magnetism even where i stood and the magnetism like the profile was vaguely familiar to me where had i experienced it in a flash i remembered the man was hubert de ross but how changed since last i saw him that was seven or eight years ago in the strand he was then as usual out of an engagement and borrowed half a crown it seemed a privilege to lend anything to him he was always magnetic and why his magnetism had never made him successful on the london stage was always a mystery to me he was an excellent actor and a man of sober habit but like many others of his kind hubert le ross i do not of course give the actual name by which he was known drifted seedily away into the provinces and i like every one else ceased to remember him it was strange to see him after all these years here on the platform of euston looking so prosperous and solid it was not only the flesh that he had put on but also the clothes that made him hard to recognize in the old days an imitation fur coat had seemed to be as integral a part of him as were his ill-shorn lantern jaws but now his costume was a model of rich and sombre moderation drawing not calling attention to itself he looked like a banker any one would have been proud to be seen off by him stand back please the train was about to start and i waved farewell to my friend le ross did not stand back he stood clasping in both hands the hands of the young american stand back sir please he obeyed but quickly darted forward again to whisper some final word i think there were tears in her eyes there certainly were tears in his when at length having watched the train out of sight he turned round he seemed nevertheless delighted to see me he asked me where i had been hiding all these years and simultaneously repaid me the half-crown as though it had been borrowed yesterday he linked his arm in mine and walked me slowly along the platform saying with what pleasure he read my dramatic criticisms every saturday i told him in return how much he was missed on the stage ah yes he said i never act on the stage nowadays he laid some emphasis on the word stage and i asked him where then did he act on the platform he answered you mean said i that you recite at concerts he smiled this he whispered striking his stick on the ground is the platform i mean had his mysterious prosperity unhinged him he looked quite sane I begged him to be more explicit. I suppose, he said presently, giving me a light for the cigar which he had offered me, you have been seeing a friend off? I assented. He asked me what I supposed he had been doing. I said that I had watched him doing the same thing. No, he said gravely, that lady was not a friend of mine. I met her for the first time this morning, less than half an hour ago, here and again he struck the platform with his stick i confess that i was bewildered he smiled you may he said have heard of the anglo-american social bureau i had not he explained to me that of the thousands of americans who annually pass through england there are many hundreds who have no english friends in the old days they used to bring letters of introduction but the english are so inhospitable that these letters are hardly worth the paper they are written on thus said le ross the a a s b supplies a long-felt want americans are a sociable people and most of them have plenty of money to spend the a a s b supplies them with english friends fifty per cent of the fees is paid over to the friends the other fifty is retained by the a a s b I am not, alas, a director. If I were, I should be a very rich man indeed. I am only an employee. But even so, I do very well. I am one of the seers off. Again I asked for enlightenment. Many Americans, he said, cannot afford to keep friends in England, but they can all afford to be seen off. 
the fee is only five pounds twenty-five dollars for a single traveller and eight pounds forty dollars for a party of two or more they send that in to the bureau giving the date of their departure and a description by which the seer off can identify them on the platform and then well then they are seen off but is it worth it i exclaimed of course it is worth it said la ross it prevents them from feeling out of it it earns them the respect of the guard it saves them from being despised by their fellow passengers the people who are going to be on the boat it gives them a footing for the whole voyage besides it is a great pleasure in itself you saw me seeing that young lady off didn't you think i did it beautifully beautifully i admitted i envied you there was i yes i can imagine there were you shuffling from foot to foot staring blankly at your friend trying to make conversation i know that's how i used to be myself before i studied and went into the thing professionally i don't say i'm perfect yet i'm still a martyr to platform fright a railway station is the most difficult of all places to act in as you have discovered for yourself but i said with resentment i wasn't trying to act i really felt so did i my boy said Laurence. you can't act without feeling what's his name the frenchman diderot yes said you could but what did he know about it didn't you see those tears in my eyes when the train started i hadn't forced them i tell you i was moved so were you i dare say but you couldn't have pumped up a tear to prove it you can't express your feelings in other words you can't act at any rate he added kindly not in a railway station teach me i cried he looked thoughtfully at me well he said at length the seeing off season is practically over yes i'll give you a course i have a good many pupils on hand already but yes he said consulting an ornate notebook i could give you an hour on tuesdays and fridays his terms i confess are rather high but i don't grudge the investment End of section two Section three of Yet Again by Max Beerbohm. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Memory of a Midnight Express. Often I have presentiments of evil, but never having had one of them fulfilled, I am beginning to ignore them. I find that I have always walked straight, serenely impressioned into whatever trap fate has laid for me when i think of any horrible thing that has befallen me the horror is intensified by recollection of its suddenness but a moment before i had been quite happy quite secure a moment later i shudder why be thus at fate's mercy always when with a little ordinary second sight yet no that is the worst of a presentiment it never averts evil it does but unnerve the victim best after all to have only false presentiments like mine bolts that cannot be dodged strike us kindliest from the blue and so let me be thankful that my sole emotion as i entered an empty compartment at hollyhead was that craving for sleep which after midnight overwhelms every traveller especially the saxon traveller from tumultuous and quick-witted little dublin mechanically comfortably as i sank into a corner i rolled my rug round me laid my feet against the opposite cushions twitched up my coat-collar above my ears, twitched down my cap over my eyes. It was not the jerk of the starting train that half awoke me, but the consciousness that someone had flung himself into the compartment 
when the train was already in motion. I saw a small man putting something in the rack, a large black handbag. Through the haze of my sleep I saw him, vaguely resented him. He had no business to have slammed the door like that, no business to have jumped into a moving train, no business to put that huge handbag into a rack which was for light baggage only, and no business to be wearing at this hour and in this place a top hat. These four peevish objections floated sleepily together round my brain. It was not till the man turned round and I met his eye that I awoke fully, awoke to danger. I had never seen a murderer, but I knew that the man who was so steadfastly peering at me now... I shut my eyes. I tried to think. Could I be dreaming? In books I had read of people pinching themselves to see whether they were really awake, but in actual life there never was any doubt on that score. The great thing was that I should keep all my wits about me. Everything might depend on presence of mind. Perhaps this murderer was mad. If you fix a lunatic with your eye, screwing up my courage, I fixed the man with my eye. I had never seen such a horrible little eye as his. It was a sane eye, too. It radiated a cold and ruthless sanity. It belonged not to a man who would kill you wantonly, but to one who would not scruple to kill you for a purpose, and who would do the job quickly and neatly, and not be found out. Was he physically strong? Though he looked very wiry, he was little and narrow like his eyes. He could not overpower me by force, I thought and instinctively I squared my shoulders against the cushions, that he might realize the impossibility of overpowering me. But I felt he had enough science to make me less than a match for him. I tried to look cunning and determined. I longed for a mustache like his to hide my somewhat amiable mouth. I was thankful I could not see his mouth, could not know the worst of the face that was staring at me in the lamplight, and yet what could be worse than his eyes, gleaming from the deep shadow cast by the brim of his top hat? What deadlier than that square jaw, with the bone so sharply delineated under the taut skin? The train rushed on, noisily swaying through the silence of the night, I thought of the unseen series of placid landscapes that we were passing through, of the unconscious cottagers snoring there in their beds, of the safe people in the next compartment to mine, to his. Not moving a muscle, we sat there, we two, watching each other, like two hostile cats. Or rather, I thought, he watched me as a snake watches a rabbit, and I, like a rabbit, could not look away. I seemed to hear my heart beating time to the train. Suddenly my heart was at a standstill, and the double beat of the train receded faintly. The man was pointing upwards. I shook my head. He had asked me, in a low voice, whether he should pull the hood across the lamp. He was standing now with his back turned towards me, pulling his handbag out of the rack. He had a furtive back, the back of a man who, in his day, had borne many an alias. To this day I am ashamed that I did not spring up and pinion him there and then. Had I possessed one ounce of physical courage, I should have done so. A coward... I let slip the opportunity. I thought of the communication cord, but how could I move to it? He would be too quick for me. He would be very angry with me. I would sit quite still and wait. 
every moment was a long reprieve to me now something might intervene to save me there might be a collision on the line perhaps he was a quite harmless man i caught his eyes and shuddered his bag was open on his knees his right hand was groping in it thank heaven he had not pulled the hood over the lamp i saw him pull out something a limp thing made of black cloth not unlike the thing which a dentist places over your mouth when laughing gas is to be administered laughing gas no laughing matter the irrelevant and idiotic embryo of a pun dangled itself for an instant in my brain what other horrible thing would come out of the bag perhaps some gleaming instrument he closed the bag with a snap laid it beside him he took off his top hat laid that beside him i was surprised i know not why to see that he was bald there was a gleaming high light on his bald round head the limp black thing was a cap which he slowly adjusted with both hands drawing it down over the brow and behind the ears it seemed to me as though he were after all hooding the lamp in my feverish fancy the compartment grew darker when the orb of his head was hidden the shadow of another simile for his action came surging up he had put on the cap so gravely so judicially yes that was it he had assumed the black cap the decent symbol which indemnifies the taker of a life and might the lord have mercy on my soul already he was addressing me what had he said i asked him to repeat it my voice sounded even further away than his he repeated that he thought we had met before i heard my voice saying politely somewhere in the distance that i thought not he suggested that i had been staying at some hotel in colchester six years ago my voice drawing a little nearer to me explained that i never in my life had been at colchester he begged my pardon and hoped no offence would be taken where none had been meant my voice coming right back to its own quarters reassured him that of course i had taken no offence at all adding that i myself very often mistook one face for another he replied rather inconsequently that the world was a small place evidently he must have prepared this remark to follow my expected admission that i had been at that hotel in colchester six years ago and have thought it too striking a remark to be thrown away a guileless creature evidently and not a criminal at all then i reflected that the most successful criminals succeed rather through the incomparable guilelessness of the police than through any devilish cunning in themselves besides this man looked the very incarnation of ruthless cunning surely he must but have dissembled my suspicion of him resurged but somehow i was no longer afraid of him whatever crimes he might have been committing and be going to commit i felt that he meant no harm to me after all why should i have imagined myself to be in danger meanwhile i would try to draw the man out pitting my wits against his i proceeded to do so he was very voluble in a quiet way before long i was in possession of all the materials for an exhaustive biography of him and the strange thing was that i could not with the best will in the world believe that he was lying to me i had never heard a man telling so obviously the truth and the truth about any one however commonplace must always be interesting indeed it is the commonplace truth the truth of widest application that is the most interesting of all truths 
I do not now remember many details of this man's story. I remember merely that he was travelling in lace, that he had been born at Boulogne. This was the one strange feature of the narrative, that somebody had once left him a hundred pounds in a will, and that he had a little daughter who was as pretty as a pink. But at the time I was enthralled. Besides, I liked the man immensely. He was a kind and simple soul, utterly belying his appearance. I wondered how I ever could have feared him and hated him. Doubtless the reaction from my previous state intensified the kindliness of my feelings. Anyhow, my heart went out to him. I felt that we had known each other for many years. While he poured out his recollections, I felt that he was an old crony, talking over old days, which were mine as well as his. Little by little, however, the slumber which he had scared from me came hovering back. My eyelids drooped. My comments on his stories became few and muffled. There, he said, you're sleepy. I ought to have thought of that. I protested feebly. He insisted kindly. You go to sleep, he said, rising and drawing the hood over the lamp. It was dawn when I awoke. Someone in the top hat was standing over me and saying, Euston. Euston? I repeated. Yes, this is Euston. Good day to you. Good day to you, I repeated mechanically in the grey dawn. Not till I was driving through the cold, empty streets did I remember the episode of the night and who it was that had awoken me. I wished I could see my friend again. It was horrible to think that perhaps I should never see him again. I had liked him so much, and he had seemed to like me. I should not have said that he was a happy man. There was something melancholy about him. I hoped he would prosper. I had a foreboding that some great calamity was in store for him, and wished I could avert it. I thought of his little daughter, who was as pretty as a pink. Perhaps fate was going to strike him through her. Perhaps, when he got home, he would find that she was dead. There were tears in my eyes when I alighted on my doorstep. Thus, within a little space of time, did I experience two deep emotions, for neither of which was there any real justification. I experienced terror, though there was nothing to be afraid of, and I experienced sorrow, though there was nothing at all to be sorry about, and both my terror and my sorrow were, at the time, overwhelming. You have no patience with me? Examine yourselves. Examine one another. In every one of us, the deepest emotions are constantly caused by some absurdly trivial thing, or by nothing at all. Conversely, the great things in our lives, the true occasions for wrath, anguish, rapture, what not, very often leave us quite calm. We can never depend on any right adjustment of emotion to circumstance. That is one of many reasons which prevent the philosopher from taking himself and his fellow beings quite so seriously as he would wish. End of section three. Section 4 of Yet Again by Max Beerbohm. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Poro Unum. By graceful custom, every newcomer to a throne in Europe 
pays a round of visits to his neighbours. When King Edward came back from seeing the Tsar at Reval, his subjects seemed to think that he had fulfilled the last demand on his civility. That was in the days of Abdul Hamid. None of us wished for the king to visit Turkey. Turkey is not internationally powerful, nor had Abdul any Guelph blood in him, and so we were able to assert, by ignoring her and him, our humanitarianism and passion for liberty quite safely, quite politely. Now that Abdul is deposed from his infernal throne, it is taken as a matter of course that the king will visit his successor. Well, let his majesty betake himself and his tact and a full cargo of Victorian orders to Constantinople by all means. But on the way, nestling in the very heart of Europe, perfectly civilized and strifeless, jeweled all over with freedom, is another country which he has not visited since his accession, a country which, oddly enough, none but I seems to expect him to visit. Why, I ask, should Switzerland be cold-shouldered? I admit she does not appeal to the romantic imagination. She never has, as a nation, counted for anything, physically soaring out of sight, morally and intellectually she has lain low and said nothing not one idea not one deed has she to her credit all that is worth knowing of her history can be set forth without compression in a few lines of a guide-book her one and only hero william tell never as we now know existed he has proved to be a myth also, he is the one and only myth that Switzerland has managed to create. He exhausted her poor little stock of imagination. Living as pygmies among the blind excesses of nature, living on sufferance there, animalculae, her sons have been overwhelmed from the outset, have had no chance whatsoever of development. Even if they had a language of their own, they would have no literature. Not one painter, not one musician have they produced. Only couriers, guides, waiters, and other parasites. A smug, tame, sly, dull, mercenary little race of men, they exist by and for the alien tripper. They are the fine flower of commercial civilization the shining symbol of international comity, and have never done anybody any harm. I cannot imagine why the king should not give them the incomparable advertisement of a visit. Not that they are badly in need of advertisement over here. Every year the British trippers to Switzerland vastly outnumber the British trippers to any other land a fact which shows how little the romantic imagination tells as against cheapness and comfort of hotels and the notion that a heart strained by climbing is good for the health and this fact does but make our sovereign's abstention the more remarkable switzerland is not smart but a king is not the figurehead merely of his entourage he is the whole nation's figurehead. Switzerland alone among nations is a British institution, and King Edward ought not to snub her. That we expect him to do so without protest from us seems to me a rather grave symptom of flunkeyism. Fiercely resenting that imputation, you proceed to raise difficulties. Who, you say, would there be to receive the king? in the name of the swiss republic i promptly answer the president of the swiss republic you did not expect that you had quite forgotten if indeed you had ever heard that there was any such person for the life of you you could not tell me his name well his name is not very widely known even in switzerland a friend of mine, who was there lately, tells me that he asked one Swiss after another what was the name of the president, 
and that they all sought refuge in polite astonishment at such ignorance and when pressed for the name could only screw up their eyes snap their fingers and feverishly declare that they had it on the tips of their tongues this is just as it should be in an ideal republic there should be no one whose name might not at any moment slip the memory of his fellows some sort of foreman there must be for the state's convenience but the more obscure he be and the more automatic the better for the ideal of equality in the republics of france and of america the president is of an extrusive kind his office has been fashioned on the monarchic model and his whole position is anomalous he has to try to be ornamental as well as useful a symbol as well as a pivot obviously it is absurd to single out one man as a symbol of the equality of all men and not less unreasonable is it to expect him to be inspiring as a patriotic symbol an incarnation of his country only an anointed king whose forefathers were kings too can be that in france where kings have been no one can get up the slightest pretense of emotion for the president if the president is modest and unassuming and doesn't as did the late m Faure, make an ass of himself by behaving in a kingly manner he is safe from ridicule the amused smiles that follow him are not unkind but in no case is any one proud of him never does any one see france in him in america where no kings have been they are able to make a pretense of enthusiasm for a president but no real chord of national sentiment is touched by this eminent gentleman who has no past or future eminence who has been shoved forward for a space and will anon be sent packing in favour of some other upstart let some princeling of a foreign state set foot in america and lo all the inhabitants are tumbling over one another in their desire for a glimpse of him a desire which is the natural and pathetic outcome of their unsatisfied inner craving for a dynasty of their own human nature being what it is a monarchy is the best expedient all the world over but given a republic let the thing be done thoroughly let the appearance be well kept up as in switzerland let the president be as there a furtive creature and insignificant not merely coming no man knows whence nor merely passing no man knows whither but existing no man knows where and existing not even as a name except on the tip of the tongue national dignity as well as the republican ideal is served better thus besides it is less trying for the president and yet stronger than all my sense of what is right and proper is the desire in me that the president of the swiss republic should just for once be dragged forth blinking from his burrow in bern bern is the capital of switzerland into the glare of european publicity and be driven in a landau to the railway station there to await the king of england and kiss him on either cheek when he dismounts from the train while the massed orchestras of all the principal hotels play our national anthem and also a swiss national anthem hastily composed for the occasion i want him to entertain the king that evening at a great banquet whereat his majesty will have the president's wife on his right hand and will make a brief but graceful speech in the swiss language english french german and italian consecutively referring to the glorious and never to be forgotten name of william tell embarrassed silence 
and to the vast number of his subjects who annually visit Switzerland. Loud and prolonged cheers. Next morning, let there be a review of 20,000 waiters from all parts of the country, all the head waiters receiving a modest grade of the Victorian order. Later in the day, let the king visit the National Gallery, a hall filled with picture postcards of the most picturesque spots in Switzerland, and thence let him be conducted to the principal factory of cuckoo clocks, and after some of the clocks have been made to strike, be heard remarking to the president with a hearty laugh that the sound is like that of a cuckoo. How the second day of the visit would be filled up, I do not know. I leave that to the president's discretion. Before his departure to the frontier, the king will, of course, be made honorary manager of one of the principal hotels. I hope to be present in Bern during these great days in the president's life. But if anything happened to keep me here, I shall content myself with the prospect of his visit to London. I long to see him and his wife driving past, with the proper escort of lifeguards, under a vista of quadrilingual mottoes, bowing acknowledgments to us. I wonder what he is like. I picture him as a small, spare man, with a slightly grizzled beard, and pleasant, though shifty, eyes behind a pince-nez. I picture him frock-coated, bowler-hatted, and evidently nervous. His wife? I cannot at all imagine. End of section 4《Section 5 of Yet Again》by Max Beerbohm. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Club in Ruins An antique ruin has its privileges. The longer the period of its crumbling, the more do the owls build their nests in it, the more do the excursionists munch in it their sandwiches. Thus, year by year, its fame increases till it looks back with contempt on the days when it was a mere upright waterproof. Local guidebooks pander more and more slavishly to its pride. Leader writers, in need of a pathetic metaphor, are more and more frequently supplied by it. If there be any sordid question of clearing it away to make room for something else, the public outcry is positively deafening. Not that we are still under the sway of that peculiar cult which beset us in the earlier part of the nineteenth century. A bad poet or painter can no longer reap the reward of genius merely by turning his attention to ruins under moonlight, nor does any one cause to be built in his garden a broken turret for the evocation of sensibility in himself and his guests. There used to be one such turret near the summit of Campton Hill, but that familiar imposture was raised a year or two ago, no one protesting. Fuit, the frantic, factitious sentimentalism for ruins. On the other hand, the sentiment for them is as strong as ever it was. Decrepit Carisbrook and its rivals annually tighten their hold on Britannia's heart. I do not grudge them their success, but the very fact that they are so successful inclines me to reserve my own personal sentiment, rather, for those unwept, unsung ruins which so often confront me, here and there, in the streets of this aggressive metropolis. The ruins made, not by time, but by the ruthless skill of labor, the ruins of houses not old enough to be sacrosanct nor new enough to keep pace with the demands of a gasping and plethoric community. These are the ruins that move me to tears. No owls flutter in them, 
no trippers lunch in them in no guide-book or leading article will you find them mentioned their pathetic interiors gape to the sky and to the street but nor gods nor men hold out a hand to save them the patterns of bedroom wallpapers chosen with what care after how long discussion only a few short years or months ago stare out their obvious piteous appeal to us for mercy and their dumb agony is echoed dumbly by the places where doors have been doors that lately were tapped at by respectful knuckles or the places where staircases have been staircases down whose banisters lately slid little children laughing exposed humiliated doomed the home throws out a hundred pleas to us and the pharisaic community passes by on the other side of the way in fear of a falling brick down come the walls of the home as quickly as pickaxes can send them down they crumble piecemeal into the foundations and are carted away soon other walls will be rising red brick residential walls more in harmony with the zeitgeist none but i pays any heed to the ruins i am their only friend me they attract so irresistibly that i haunt the door of the hoarding that encloses them and am frequently mistaken for the foreman a few summers ago i was watching with more than usual emotion the razure of a great edifice at a corner of hanover square there were two reasons why this razure especially affected me i had known the edifice so well by sight ever since i was a small boy and i had always admired it as a fine example of that kind of architecture which is the most suitable to london's atmosphere though i must have passed it thousands of times i had never passed without an upward smile of approval that gaunt and sombre facade with its long straight windows its well-spaced columns its long straight coping against the london sky my eyes deplored that these noble and familiar things must perish for sake of what they had sheltered my heart deplored that they must perish the falling edifice had not been exactly a home it had been even more than that it had been a refuge from many homes it had been a club certainly it had not been a particularly distinguished club its demolition could not have been stayed on the plea that charles james fox had squandered his substance in its card-room or that lord melbourne had loved to doze on the benches in its hall nothing sublime had happened in it no sublime person had belonged to it persons without the vaguest pretensions to sublimity had always i believe found quick and easy entrance into it it had been a large nondescript affair but to adapt byron a club's a club though every one's in it the ceremony of election gives it a cachet which not even the smartest hotel has and then there is the notepaper and there are the newspapers and the cigars at wholesale prices and the not to be tipped waiters and other blessings for mankind if the members of this club had but migrated to some other building taking their effects and their constitution with them the ruin would have been pathetic enough but alas the outward wreck was a symbol a result of inner dissolution through the door of the hoarding the two pillars of the front door told a sorry tale pasted on either of them was a dingy bill bearing the sinister imprimatur of an auctioneer and offering in capitals of various sizes bedroom suites walnut and mahogany turkey indian and wilton pile carpets two full-sized billiard tables a remington typewriter a double door fireproof and other objects not less useful and delightful 
The club, then, had gone to smash. The members had been disbanded, driven out of this Eden by the fiery sword of the law, driven back to their homes. Sighing over the marcessibility of human happiness, I peered between the pillars into the excavated and chaotic hall. The porter's hatch was still there in the wall. There it was, wondering why no inquiries were made through it now, or, maybe, why it had not been sold into bondage with the double door and the rest of the fixtures, a melancholy relic of past glories. I crossed over to the other side of the road and passed my eye over the whole ruin. The roof, the ceilings, most of the inner walls, had already fallen. Little remained but the grim, familiar façade, a thin husk. I noted, that which I had never noted before, two iron grills in the masonry, miserable travesties of usefulness, ventilating the open air. Through the gaping windows against the wall of the next building, I saw in mid-air the greenish Lincrusta Walton of what I guessed to have been the billiard-room, the billiard-room that had boasted two full-sized tables. Above it ran a frieze of white and gold. It was interspersed with flat Corinthian columns. The gilding of the capitals was very fresh, and glittered gaily under the summer sunbeams and hardly a day of the next autumn and winter passed but i was drawn back to the ruin by a kind of lugubrious magnetism the strangest thing was that the ruin seemed to remain in practically the same state as when first i had come upon it the facade stood still high this might have been due to the proverbial laziness of british workmen but i did not think it could be the workmen were always plying their pickaxes, with apparent gusto and assiduity, along the top of the building. Bricks and plaster were always crashing down into the depths and sending up clouds of dust. I preferred to think the building renewed itself, by some magical process, every night. I preferred to think it was prepared thus to resist its aggressors, for so long a time that, in the end, there would be an intervention from other powers. Perhaps from this site no residential affair was destined to scrape the sky. Perhaps the saint to whom the club had dedicated itself would reappear at length, glorious equestrian, to slay the dragons who had infested and desecrated his premises. I wondered whether he would then restore the ruins, reinstating the club, and setting it for ever on a sound commercial basis, or would leave them just as they were, a fixed signal to sensibility. But when first I saw the poor façade being pickaxed, I did not give it more than a fortnight. I had no feeling but of hopeless awe and pity. The workmen on the coping seemed to me ministers of inexorable Olympus, executing an Olympian decree, and the building seemed to me a live victim, a scapegoat, suffering sullenly for sins it had not committed. To me it seemed to be flinching under every rhythmic blow of those well-wielded weapons, praying for the hour when sunset should bring its surcease from that daily ordeal, I caught myself nodding to it, a nod of sympathy, of hortation to endurance. Immediately I was ashamed of my lapse into anthropomorphism. I told myself that my pity ought to be kept for the real men who had been frequenters of the building, who were now waifs. I reviewed the gaping, glassless windows through which they had been wont to watch the human comedy. There they had stood puffing their smoke and cracking their jests, and tearing women's reputations to shreds? Not that I, personally, have ever heard a woman's reputation torn to shreds in a club window. A constant reader of lady novelists, I have always been hoping for this excitement, but somehow it has never come my way. 
I am beginning to suspect that it never will, and am inclined to regard it as a figment. Such conversation as I have heard in clubs has been always of a very mild, perfunctory kind. A social club, even though it be a club with a definite social character, is a collection of heterogeneous creatures, and its aim is perfect harmony and good fellowship. Thus any definite expression of opinion by any member is regarded as dangerous. The ideal clubman is he who looks genial and says nothing at all. Most Englishmen find little difficulty in conforming with this ideal. They belong to a silent race. Social clubs flourish, therefore, in England. Intelligent foreigners, seeing them, recognize their charm and envy us them, and try to reproduce them at home. But the continent is too loquacious. On it social clubs quickly degenerate into bear gardens, and the basic ideal of good fellowship goes by the board. In Paris, Petersburg, Vienna, the only social clubs that prosper are those which are devoted to games of chance, those which induce silence by artificial means. Were I a foreign visitor, taking cursory glances, I should doubtless be delighted with the clubs of London. Had I the honour to be an Englishman, I should doubtless love them. But being a foreign resident, I am somewhat oppressed by them. I crave in them a little freedom of speech, even though such freedom were their ruin. I long for their silence to be broken here and there, even though such breakage broke them with it. It is not enough for me to hear a hushed exchange of mild jokes about the weather, or of comparisons between what the time says and what the standard says. I pine for a little vivacity, a little boldness, a little variety, a few gestures. A London club, as it is conducted, seems to me very like a catacomb. It is tolerable so long as you do not actually belong to it. But when you do belong to it, when you have outlived the fleeting gratification at having been elected, when you... But I ought not to have fallen into the second-person plural. You, readers, are free-born Englishmen. These clubs come natural to you. You love them. To them you slip eagerly from your homes. As for me, poor alien, had I been a member of the club whose demolition has been my theme, I should have grieved for it not one whit the more bitterly. Indeed, my tears would have been a trifle less salt. It was my detachment that enabled me to be so prodigal of pity. THE POOR WAIFS Long did I stand, in the sunshine of that day when first I saw the ruin, wondering and distressed, ruthful, indignant that such things should be. I forgot on what errand I had come out. I recalled it. Once or twice I walked away, bent on its fulfilment. But I could not proceed further than a few yards. I halted, looked over my shoulder, was drawn back to the spot, drawn by the crude, insistent anthem of the pickaxes. The sun slanted toward Notting Hill. Still I loitered, spellbound. I was aware of someone at my side, someone asking me a question. "'I beg your pardon,' I said. The stranger was a tall man, bronzed and bearded. He repeated his question. In answer, I pointed silently to the ruin. "'That!' he gasped. He stared vacantly. I saw that his face had become pale under its sunburn. He looked from the ruin to me. "'You're not joking with me?' he said thickly. I assured him that I was not. I assured him that this was indeed the club to which he had asked to be directed." "'But,' he stammered, "'but 
but you were a member i suggested i am a member he cried and what's more i'm going to write to the committee i suggested that there was one fatal objection to such a course i spoke to him calmly soothed him with words of reason elicited from him little by little his sad story it appeared that he had been a member of the club for ten years but had never except once as a guest been inside it he had been elected on the very day on which by compulsion of his father he set sail for australia he was a mere boy at the time bitterly he hated leaving old england nor did he ever find the life of a squatter congenial the one thing which enabled him to endure those ten years of unpleasant exile was the knowledge that he was a member of a london club year by year it was a keen pleasure to him to send his annual subscription it kept him in touch with civilization, in touch with home he loved to know that when at length he found himself once again in the city of his birth he would have a firm foothold on sociability the friends of his youth might die or might forget him but as a member of a club he would find substitutes for them in less than no time herding bullocks all day long on the arid plains of central australia he used to keep up his spirits by thinking of that first whisky and soda which he would order from a respectful waiter as he entered his club all night long wrapped in his blanket beneath the stars he used to dream of that drink to come that first symbol of an unlost grip on civilization he had arrived in london this very afternoon depositing his luggage at an hotel he had come straight to his club and now he filled up his aposiopesis with an uncouth gesture signifying i may as well get back to australia i was on the point of offering to take him to my own club and give him his first whisky and soda therein but i refrained the sight of an extant club might have maddened the man it certainly was very hard for him to have belonged to a club for ten years to have loved it so passionately from such a distance and then to find himself destined never to cross its threshold why after all should he not cross its threshold i asked him if he would like to what he growled would be the good i appealed not in vain to the imaginative side of his nature i went to the door of the hoarding and explained matters to the foreman and presently nodding to me solemnly he passed with the foreman through the gap between the doorposts i saw him crossing the excavated hall crossing it along a plank slowly and cautiously his attitude was very like blondin's but it had a certain tragic dignity which blondin's lacked and that was the last i saw of him i hailed a cab and drove away what became of the poor fellow i do not know often as i returned to the ruin and long as i loitered by it him i never saw again perhaps he really did go straight back to australia or perhaps he induced the workmen to bury him alive in the foundations his fate whatever it was haunts me end of section five Section six of Yet Again by Max Beerbohm. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Two seventy three. This is an age of prescriptions. 
morning after morning from the back page of your newspaper quick and uncostly cures for every human ill thrust themselves wildly on you the age of miracles is not past but i would raise no false hopes of myself i am no thaumaturgist do you awake with a striking sensation in the stomach have you lost the power of assimilating food are you oppressed with an indescribable lassitude can you no longer follow the simplest train of thought are you troubled throughout the night with a hacking cough in fine are you but a tissue of all the most painful symptoms of all the most malignant maladies ancient and modern if so skip this essay and try somebody's elixir the cure that i offer is but a cure for overwrought nerves a substitute for the ordinary rest cure nor is it absurdly cheap nor is it instant it will take a week or so of your time but then the rest cure takes at least a month the scale of payment for board and lodging may be per diem hardly lower than in the rest cure but you will save all but a pound or so of the very heavy fees that you would have to pay to your doctor and your nurse or nurses and certainly my cure is the more pleasant of the two my patient does not have to cease from life he is not undressed and tucked into bed and forbidden to stir hand or foot during his whole term he is not forbidden to receive letters or to read books or to look on any face but his nurses or nurses nor above all is he condemned to the loathsome necessity of eating so much food as to make him dread the sight of food doubtless the grim inexorable process of the rest cure is very good for him who is strong enough and brave enough to bear it and rich enough to pay for it i address myself to the frailer cowardlier needier man instead of ceasing from life and entering purgatory he need but essay a variation in life he need but go and stay by himself in one of those vast modern hotels which abound along the south and east coasts you are disappointed all simple ideas are disappointing and all good cures spring from simple ideas the right method of treating overwrought nerves is to get the patient away from himself to make a new man of him and this trick can be done only by switching him off from his usual environment his usual habits the ordinary rest cure by its very harshness intensifies a man's personality at first drives him miserably within himself and only by its long duration does it gradually wear him down and build him up anew there is no harshness in the vast hotels which i have recommended you may eat there as little as you like especially if you are en pension letters may be forwarded to you there though unless your case is a very mild one i would advise you not to leave your address at home there are reading rooms where you can see all the newspapers though i advise you to ignore them you suffer under no sense of tyranny and yet no sooner have you signed your name in the visitor's book and had your bedroom allotted to you than you feel that you have surrendered yourself irreplevably it is not necessary to this illusion that you should pass under an assumed name unless you happen to be a very eminent actor or cricketer or other idol of the nation whose presence would flutter the young persons at the bureau if your nervous breakdown be as it most likely is due to mere intellectual distinction these young persons will mete out to you no more than the bright callous civility which they mete out impartially to all but those few who come before them to them you will be a number and to yourself you will have suddenly become a number 
the number graven on the huge brass label that depends clanking from the key put into the hand of the summoned chambermaid you are merely let us say two seventy three up you go in the lift realizing as for the first time your insignificance in infinity and rather proud to be even a number you recognize your double on the door that has been unlocked for you no prisoner clapped into his cell could feel less personal less important a notice on the wall politely requesting you to leave your key at the bureau as though you were strong enough or capacious enough to carry it about with you comes as a pleasant reminder of your freedom you remember joyously that you are even free from yourself you have begun a new life have forgotten the old and these blank fresh walls that you have never seen and that never were seen by any one whom you know their pattern is of poppies and mandragora surely poppies and mandragora are woven too on the brand new axminster beneath your elastic step come in a porter bears in your trunk deposits it on a trestle at the foot of the bed unstraps it leaves you alone with it it seems to be trying to remind you of something or other you do not listen you laugh as you open it you know that if you examined these shirts you would find them marked two seventy three before dressing for dinner you take a hot bath there are patent taps some for fresh water others for sea water you hesitate yet you know that whichever you touch will effuse but the water of lethe after all you dress before your fire the coals have burnt now to a lovely glow once again you eye them suspiciously but no there are no faces in them all's well sleek and fresh you sit down to dinner in the grande salle à manger graven on your wine glasses emblazoned on your soup plate are the armorial bearings of the company that shelters you the college of arms might sneer at them be down on them but to you they are a joy in their grand lack of links with history they are a sympathetic symbol of your own newness your own impersonality you glance down the endless menu it has been composed for a community none of your favorite dishes you once had favorite dishes appears in it thank heaven you will work your way through it steadily unquestioningly gladly with a communal palate and the wine all wines are alike here surely you scour the list vaguely and order a pint of two seventy three your eye roves over the adjacent tables you behold a galaxy of folk evidently born like yourself anew some like yourself are solitary others are with wives with children but with new wives new children the associations of home have been forgotten even though home's actual appendages be here the members of the little domestic circles are using company manners they are actually making conversation breaking the ice they are new here to one another they are new to themselves how much newer to you you cannot place them that paterfamilias with the red moustache is he a soldier a solicitor a stockbroker what you play vaguely vainly at the game of attributions while the little orchestra in yonder bower of artificial palm trees plays new or seemingly new cakewalks who are they these minstrels in the shadow they seem not to be the red hungarians nor the blue nor the hungarians of any other colour of the spectrum you set them down as colourless hungarians and resume your study of the tables 
They fascinate you, these your fellow diners. You fascinate them, doubtless. They, doubtless, are cudgeling their brains to spot your state in life, your past, which now has escaped you. Next day, some of them are gone, and you miss them, almost bitterly. But others succeed them, not less detached and enigmatic than they. You must never speak to one of them. You must never lapse into those casual acquaintances of the lounge or the smoking-room. Nor is it hard to avoid them. No Englishman, how gregarious and garrulous soever, will dare address another Englishman in whose eye is no spark of invitation. There must be no such spark in yours. Silence is part of the cure for you, and a very important part. It is mainly through unaccustomed silence that your nerves are made trim again. Usually you are giving out in talk all that you receive through your senses of perception. Keep silence now. Its gold will accumulate in you at compound interest. You will realize the joy of being full of reflections and ideas. You will begin to hoard them proudly, like a miser. You will gloat over your own cleverness, you who but a few days since were feeling so stupid. Solitude in a crowd, silence among chatterboxes, these are the best ministers to a mind diseased. And with the restoration of the mind, the body will be restored too. You, who were physically so limp and pallid, will be a ruddy Hercules now. And when, at the moment of departure, you pass through the hall, shyly distributing to the servants the largesse which is so slight in comparison with what your doctor and nurse or nurses would have levied on you to resume that burden of personality whereunder you had sunk you will be victoriously yourself again yet i think you will look back a little wistfully on the period of your obliteration people for people are very nice really most of them will tell you that they have missed you you will reply that you did not miss yourself and you will go the more strenuously to your work and pleasure so as to have the sooner an excuse for a good riddance end of section six section seven of yet again by Max Beerbohm. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Study in Dejection Riderless the horse was, and with none to hold his bridle. But he waited patiently, submissively, there where I saw him, at the shabby corner of a certain shabby little street in Chelsea my beautiful my beautiful thou standest meekly by sang mrs norton of her arab steed with thy proudly arched and glossy neck thy dark and fiery eye catching the eye of this other horse i saw that such fire as might once have blazed there had long smouldered away chestnut though he was he had no metal his chestnut coat was all dull and rough, unkempt as that of an inferior cab horse. Of his once luxuriant mane there were but a few poor tufts now. His saddle was torn and weather-stained. The one stirrup that dangled therefrom was red with rust. I never saw in any creature a look of such unutterable dejection dejection in the most literal sense of the word indeed was his he had been cast down he had fallen from higher and happier things with his arched neck and with other points which not neglect nor ill-usage could rob of their old grace 
he had kept something of his fallen day about him. In the window of the little shop outside which he stood were things that seemed to match him, things appealing to the sense that he appealed to. A tarnished French mirror, a strip of faded carpet, some rows of battered, tattered books, a few cups and saucers that had erst been riveted and erst been dusted, all these in the gala moffrey of other languid aunts and ends seen through this mud-splashed window silently echoed the silent misery of the horse they were remembering zion they had been beautiful once and expensive and well cared for and admired and coveted and now they had at least the consolation of being indoors public laughing-stock though they were they had a barrier of glass between themselves and the irreverent world to be warm and dry too was something piteous they could yet afford to pity the horse he was more ludicrously more painfully misplaced than they a real blood horse that has done his work is rightly left in the open air turned out into some sweet meadow or paddock it would be cruel to make him spend his declining years inside a house where no grass is is it less cruel that a fine old rocking-horse should be thrust from the nursery out into the open air upon the pavement perhaps some child had just given the horse a contemptuous shove in passing for he was rocking gently when i chanced to see him nor did he cease to rock with a slight creak upon the pavement so long as i watched him a particularly black and bitter north wind was blowing round the corner of the street perhaps it was that this kept the horse in motion boreas himself invisible to my mortal eyes may have been astride the saddle lashing the tired old horse to this futile activity but no i think rather that the poor thing was rocking of his own accord rocking to attract my attention he saw in me a possible purchaser he wanted to show me that he was still sound in wind and limb had i a small son at home if so here was the very mount for him none of your frisky showy first-hand young brutes on which no fond parent ought to risk his offspring's bones but a sound steady-going well-mannered old hack with never a spark of vice in him such was the message that i read in the glassy eye fixed on me the nostril of faded scarlet seemed for a moment to dilate and quiver at last at last was someone going to inquire his price once upon a time in a far-off fashionable toy-shop his price had been prohibitive and he the central attraction behind the gleaming shop window had plumed himself on his expensiveness he had been in no hurry to be bought it had seemed to him a good thing to stand there motionless majestic day after day far beyond the reach of average purses and having in his mien something of the frigid nobility of the horses on the parthenon frieze with nothing at all of their unreality a coat of real chestnut hair glossy glorious from end to end of the parthenon frieze not one of the horses had that from end to end of the toy-shop that exhibited him not one of the horses was thus graced their flanks were mere wood painted white miserable creatures it was difficult to believe that they had souls no wonder they were cheap and went off as the shopman said so quickly whilst he stayed grandly on cynosure of eyes that dared not hope for him into bondage they went off those others and would be worked to death doubtless by brutal little boys when one fine day 
a lady was actually not shocked by the price demanded for him his pride was hurt and when that evening he was packed in brown paper and hoisted to the roof of a four-wheeler he faced the future fiercely who was this lady that her child should dare bestride him with a biblical ha ha he vowed that the child should not stay long in the saddle he must be thrown badly even though it was his seventh birthday but this wicked intention vanished while the child danced around him in joy and wonder never yet had so many compliments been showered on him here surely was more the manner of a slave than of a master and how lightly the child rode him with never a tug or a kick and oh how splendid it was to be flying thus through the air horses were made to be ridden and he had never before savoured the true joy of life for he had never known his own strength and fleetness forward backward faster faster to floor to ceiling regiments of leaden soldiers watched his wild career noah's quite sedentary beasts gaped up at him in wonderment as tiny to him as the gaping cows in the fields are to you when you pass by in an express train this was life indeed he remembered catafalto remembered eclipse and the rest nowhere ay thought he and even thus must black bess have rejoiced along the road to york and bucephalus skimming under alexander the plains of asia must have had just this glorious sense of freedom only less so not pegasus himself can have flown more swiftly pegasus at last became a constellation in the sky some day reflected the rocking horse when the ride was over i too shall die and five stars will appear on the nursery ceiling alas for the vanity of equine ambition i wonder by what stages this poor beast came down in the world did the little boy's father go bankrupt leaving it to be sold in a lot with the other toys or was it merely given away when the little boy grew up to a poor but procreative relation who anon became poorer i should like to think that it had been mourned but i fear that whatever mourning there may have been for it must have been long ago discarded the creature did not look as if it had been ridden in any recent decade it looked as if it had almost abandoned the hope of ever being ridden again it was but hoping against hope now as it stood rocking there in the bleak twilight bright warm nurseries were for younger happier horses still it went on rocking to show me that it could rock the more sentimental a man is the less is he helpful the more loath is he to cancel the cause of his emotion i did not buy the horse a few days later passing that way i wished to renew my emotion but lo the horse was gone had some finer person than i bought it towed it to the haven where it would be likelier it had but been relegated to some murky recess of the shop i hope it had room to rock there end of section seven